Wow, okay, good afternoon. Um, I think this is relatively self-explanatory. I'm hoping this is easy. I mean, I'm, it makes sense to me, but I'm, I'm, I'm judging my, my performance yesterday, it's a bit of a stretch to expect it to make any sense to anyone else. Um, so, uh, and as I said yesterday, I'm kind of slightly repeating myself for understandable reasons. This is an attempt to um, merge, if you like, some theoretical speculation with some practical possibilities. Uh, I'm the theoretical speculation, and Tim is the practical possibilities. That's, That's what we agreed, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, my concern has been, I suppose, um, a view that um, implicitly the open community and OER are, uh, I don't know, tacitly or implicitly, I don't know, globally northern or uh, Eurocentric, um, and was there a possibly a way of addressing that? Um, and I suppose my thinking is then that actually what underpins um, pedagogy is culture in some way or another. Um, and when we try and use, if you like, OER that I'm kind of assuming it's a default position. It's unprovable, but it's a default position. If I'm assuming that the OER are somehow tainted with a specific culture, and I'm then thinking about how can we make OER more relevant or more appropriate or more applicable to other cultures, I then say, ah, OK, so I can talk about cultures being different, but can I then kind of quantify or objectify their, the distance between them? Can I, cali can I, as it were, calibrate them so that I can say, I don't know, Chinese culture is in some ways similar to culture in Saudi Arabia, therefore what fits in there in Saudi Arabia will fit in uh, China or not? Okay, do I have a way of calibrating culture that would make that kind of measurement and that kind of inference possible? And if you like, just as a kind of um, modernist, something for the sake of argument, um, I pick on... Hofstetter quite a lot as a way of provoking my thinking about it or just provoking everyone else. Um, and, and he says, yes, you can, as it were, calibrate culture. Um, and there's lots of critiques of Hofst Hofstetter. I mean, not one of them, of course, being it's modernist and cute and not much else. Um, another being that level of granularity is national. So, you know, you could argue we ought to be looking regional or uh, um, any other finer gradations. And you could argue that we're all at the intersection of various cultures, which might be uh, our institutional and professional culture and our uh, ethnic and spiritual culture and whatever else, not just our national culture. But nevertheless, he says if you choose that level of granularity and that way of looking at things, then in his uh, empirical work, he says you can identify several different axes uh, or several different dimensions of culture. For example, is the country you're looking at highly individualistic and hi or highly collectivist or somewhere in the middle? You know, and so the classic one is, well, the, you know, the United States of America is way over there in terms of individualism and, I don't know, maybe um, uh, People's Republic of China is way over there in terms of collectivism or, or communalism, as it were. Um, is there a great deal of difference between the highest in the society or the highest in the country and the lowest? Is it very hierarchic or is it very flat? And again, I'm sure one can think of kind of classical examples of at either extreme. I, you know, I imagine maybe Holland or Sweden are way over there, um, and so on and so on. Um, so, uh, well, sorry, and uh, low or high uncertainty avoidance. Is it risk taking or is it? risk avoiding, risk averse? Um, does it have a uh, long-term orientation or short-term orientation? Does that drive people's values? Um, and I suppose part of my argument would be if you thought about specific teaching techniques like, I don't know, project-based learning, group-based learning, game-based learning, um, uh, and rather than assuming they're kind of unconditionally benign, do they have some kind of resonance or dissonance with any of these particular um, dimensions? You know, and so, uh, so I've encountered the problems in maybe in parts of Southern Africa where um, individualized um, competitive group based, uh, individual and competitive work is problematic in collectivist cultures, um, you know, for example. Uh, and so and, sorry, there are various versions of this. Um, so this is one putting actual real 
definite countries on um, some of the axes, and, and probably the, the decoding is commonsensical, like Italy, France, Belgium, uh, Great Britain, and so on. And, and so you could argue that, um, or what I'm trying to argue, is that um, an OER developed in, uh, it says Great Britain there, I don't know why, uh, I mean, the, well, do I mean even the United Kingdom? The, the, well, anyway, where we live um, is no great distance in terms of these dimensions from the USA or Australia or Canada or New Zealand, and therefore it's no great stretch to see um, OERs developed in one as being relevant in any of those others. But on the other hand, it's a big stretch to Turkey, Mexico, um, and whatever it is, Guatemala, uh, you know, way over there. Um, so that's the kind of basis of my argument. Um, there are other models. It's not just Hofstetter and his um, uh, disciples. And so this is a different set of dimensions, if you like, that put the countries of the world on... Um, call this triangular axis of uh, active, linear, reactive, and so on. The advantage of Hofstetter, you'll be pleased to know, is there's an app for it. Um, so maybe that, that's why it would win this game, that you, you just put the appropriate country in and you get the numbers. And so, um, and this is another one from Hall, looking at low and high context cultures. Uh, I'll skip that and skip that. And, and so... Our proposal was the idea that uh, OER metadata should not only include all the things it currently includes, but some indication of culture. For example, the, um, that the appropriate numbers from Hofstede's six or seven axes, so that then one could talk about its transferability from its country of origin, where you know the the um, OER, uh, sorry, the, the Hofstede numbers, to somewhere else where you can look up the Hofstede numbers. And on that note, Jim. Thank you, John. So much for my half of the talk. Um, <laughs> briefly, very briefly, to tell you that the context of this is an Erasmus Plus program using, um, using MOOCs to help refugees and migrants with their linguistic skills and entrepreneurship skills for social inclusion and employment. And um, we're at the stage of the project where we're developing language MOOCs and meta MOOC to, uh, to help with this uh, project. And the way we actually started to do this, from previous experience, we've found trying to recycle old courses for this isn't necessarily effective for, cu for cultural uh, reasons. So we actually got together 20 refugee support groups in Madrid a couple of times. These are NGOs, uh, support networks, etc. And we actually asked them how do they carry out their, um, their training. And um, from this, we're able to do... Um, identify roughly almost 100 specific, um, what we believe are refugee-specific learning criteria, which we're able to classify into, into four categories. And then we actually started to think, okay, if we've got this, then how can we actually use it to uh, actually specify the, 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 the dimensions of the course we're actually going to uh, um, give to them? And I'm not going into any de details. I don't have an awful lot of uh, time here from the technological um, aspects, then we really need to uh, focus on mobile deployment because without exception all of them have uh, mobile devices. This is the main computational apparatus. For the linguistic factors it's actually very sim it's important the, the sub-languages we use are, are simple and that we subtitle appropriately. So in the case of our refugees they need to be subtitled in French and, and Arabic. From a methodological uh, perspective, then it's very important the role of proxies in the facilitation process because obviously if we're typically white European males, then we might be pushing people out of their comfort zones depending on the audience and the way we actually uh, uh, run the courses. So it's actually quite important to actually get the refugee support groups to actually participate in this project. And we are really, really happy and really, really grateful for the work they've actually done in this area because they've actually helped generate the content and they've helped facilitating and I think this is a really good uh, collaboration. And uh, as John was mentioning before, the important things here is also some of the, uh, the, the cultural factors because there's quite a heavy oral learning tradition. So we need to try and uh, incorporate a lot of this, try and keep the, the amount of text textual artifacts to a, to a minimum and um, think about the way these courses um, can actually be run. So um, the question there is, um, 
are we actually in a position to be thinking about producing a refugee metadata profile? Is it worth the effort? Because to some extent you might think, well, if we have to adapt these courses just for refugees, I mean, I didn't mention that the courses aren't just for refugees, they're for migrants and anybody who wanting to get an A1 uh, level of Spanish related to, to daily life. In, in part, the reason we're doing this is to, is to try and achieve some kind of implicit social inclusion, because if in the MOOC they're mixing with other kinds of uh, social groups, then hopefully that will facilitate social contact, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we need a, we need a, a way of representing this information, so at least we we can log what we're doing and think about how we use it in the future. But then what should we actually do with that? If we do have this metadata standard, what are we going to do? Because the platform we're basically using is our in-house install installation of, um, of open edX. I mean, what are we going to do? Are we going to hack the platform so that the, the course can be adaptively given to people? I mean, if we're giving this same course to refugees and migrants, can we just give the same course to everybody? Will it be equally popular? Because another one of the cultural aspects are that the people that are appearing in the video are culturally diverse and reflect all the different uh, ethnic groups. Will that have problems with our typical uh, white European audiences for the course? So there's lots of uh, research questions there in the, in the future. And we really are doing, focusing a bit in this area on this, on this cost-benefit analysis of, of what we can actually do with this, uh, this uh, representation of information and how we should use it in the future moving forward to new kinds of uh, courses we might want to, to run with our, with our social group. I think with that, I'm just about on time. Thank you. Go on, Joe. Seamless. <laughs> Your turn to answer the questions today. Yeah. Um, there is uh, time for questions, so does anyone have any questions after the presentation? Yes. Oh, sorry, right. Um, <laughs> sorry, my interest was actually just in raising the question, maybe rather than, rather than thinking there was an answer, um, or that there was a practical answer. I don't know if there is a practical answer, and it, it clearly requires a lot of work, and I, I guess I pointed at some of the, I don't know, if you like, theoretical reservations. I mean, I suppose if I, if I had an objective in this talk or this discussion, it was about just, um, I don't know, sensitising people to the fact that, them, that OER may be culturally specific and we can't assume that they're universal and if anyone else wants to go away and think about m moving to a next step uh, that would be great i mean i don't know what it is i'm certainly not advocating hofstetter cute though i think all of those pictures and diagrams are um uh, and, and yes yeah, uh, 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 and we shouldn't be giving the impression that refugees are kind of culturally homogenous. They're no more culturally homogenous than the rest of us uh, mm. but it would at least kind of challenge the assumption oh we can get the infrastructure right, we can put a platform up, and it won't be a problem after that. Um, so, you know, if we get any further than that, fabulous. I mean, it, it is very quickly, right, it is very difficult to answer and to actually think about how you might actually specify, you know, an application profile, etc. how will that be eaten by the platform? It's difficult because, I mean, I found it interesting, uh, David Wiley's comments this morning about learning objects, and I burnt my fingers badly making all these lovely learning objects in funded projects which no one actually bothered to reuse again. And I don't want to get down this... Uh, this uh, dead end again. So, I mean, how can we actually do this? Yeah. I suppose there is a, is a slightly more general reservation, and that's actually in relation to refugees, we might succeed in making something that was more culturally appropriate to them, and yet actually not close the distance between them and the European environment which they're trying to enter. Mm. So, so it, it's not straightforward that it, it has to work for them if it doesn't actually help them understand the cultural environment in w into which they're moving. Right. Sorry, I've only just thought about that, so I better retract everything I've yeah, previously said. Well, you could argue that actually, I mean, sorry. Curriculum or like curriculum or other country yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you could uh, you could argue that introduce even introducing the, these ideas to the to refugees or, if you like, non-Europeans would make them critically aware of the cultural divide or the cultural distance that they might have to traverse, rather than necessarily putting the onus on as it, uh, us, as it were, as the educationalist, to say that you know you're going to struggle with this for these reasons. Hofstede one, two, three, four, and five. That, that sounds like a kind of advert for critical digital literacy, I suppose, but no <laughs> harm in that. Okay, we have time for one more question.
in that view. Um, it just strikes me, I think maybe John, you put your finger on it, perhaps the answer is, the, is to put our cards on the table when we do this kind of stuff and say, look, this is where we're coming from. This, this is our approach. Metadata has a role, but I don't know if this is it. Yeah, oh, oh, maybe so. I mean, yes, I, 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 my argument would be slightly flawed if in getting all of this culture incorporated into metadata, it then turns out metadata is uh, unhelpful and unused. Uh, <laughs> that will be kind of moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic, really. Learning is a messy and contingent activity. Yes. As, as it is. Well, and, and a kind of modernist flaw might be to imagine that culture is somehow fixed and, you know, to reify culture into something that is actually fixed and stable and measurable. So, again, that, yeah. But maybe, but, well, you might argue that's just academic. And you, I'd say you have to be, be careful because there's more or less formal aspects of metadata. I mean, metadata is just data about data. So you know, I wouldn't be wanting to suggest using LOM necessarily for this. I mean, you could use XAPI or something else. But I think it's very important to have a, an explicit semantic representation of how you set stuff up. Because if you haven't, then you can't tweak the variables for the next edition of the course and you lose sight of uh, things. Perhaps uh, a way of expressing that would be and I'm going to ask you to park that until after the session just because I don't want to run out of time for everyone else but thank you both very much okay. wonderful presentation so many conversations to continue um, the next um, session is about the open med open course and we have three presenters, Fabio Nashimbeni, Daniel Villar Anrubia, and Adi Twisi, who, who, will, who will magically all speak within 15 minutes. So, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Well, we have decided to keep it uh, a little bit more simple. So I'm going to, make, to be making a very uh, brief uh, introduction to the project. And then Adi is going to, uh, to talk most of the time because this is about, this presentation in particular is about the perspective from facilitators and he's the only facilitator <laughs> here. Uh, and also Javier is with us and she's an external evaluator. So if, she, if you have any other questions about evaluation, she will be also available to reply. So OpenMed is an Erasmus Plus project as well. And it's about uh, raising awareness and facilitating the adoption of open educational practices in the South Mediterranean region. Uh, in particular, uh, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, and Palestine. Uh, this is an overview about different things that we have been doing over the last uh, three years. But today we are going to be focusing on this, uh, the capacity building course, which has been a core component, uh, especially being an Erasmus Plus project looking at capacity building uh, for higher education. So an overview of the, mod of the course, it has uh, five modules covering in total 80 hours of work. Uh, it has been translated into three languages. Uh, it has 12 facilitators and 62 participants uh, from five countries. And uh, this is um, Yes, our learning circles. Um, we have learning circles in all the partner countries and also Lebanon. So in Lebanon, we, we had a, an extra learning circle. And if you want to uh, just take the floor, Adi, and this was our first uh, the facilitator of facilitators training last September in Torino. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so uh, this um, picture was taken back in Torino and uh, as you can see there's a lot of people here. Um, most of them are facilitators who joined uh, that program um, in order to get introduced uh, to um, you know the processes that's going to happen and how are they going to present the uh, the course online to their learning circles. As we showed in the previous um, slide here, there were 12 facilitators in total and 62 learners differentiated and uh, partitioned in different groups. Uh, we call them uh, learning circles. And they are among the five countries as well. Uh, so um, uh, we, we had in the course um, 
as mentioned before, five modules. In each module, we plan to have webinars with people who have impact in open education in different countries. These are some of them, and um, we were humbled to have them in uh, our webinars as well, so that learning, our learning circle would, um, you know, understand and uh, get more insight from the outside world and from people who lead organizations in this aspect. Um, now, uh, here are some um, findings that I would like to share with you. When we uh, finished the course and I presented the module, it lasted for about, um, how, was, how, how much was that, six or seven months? And then, once it, uh, it was finished, we were running a summative and informative uh, uh, evaluation for the course. As we can see here, here's also a recap for how many, how many facilitators and trainers we have in each country. As you can see that five of them have uh, one facilitator against uh, or versus uh, the remaining of the trainees. Um, for, for the uh, remaining, some countries chose to have two facilitators uh, because um, some learners actually wanted to learn more about OER, although though they had the ability to teach online. So where they, they were teachers and instructors at the same place, but they wanted to gain more information and more uh, uh, hands-on experience on what OER are and uh, uh, try to make um, their own actually. Um, other insights that I would like to share with you is that uh, the impact was expandable actually. It wasn't also um, just narrowed and focused on uh, these universities. We had other partners, a room for other partners that I come from, for example, Damanuri University in Egypt, Yarmouk in Jordan, Helwan University in Egypt as well, and in Morocco, uh, University of Mohammed V uh, in Rabat. So uh, this is actually, um, uh, th that shows that the impact was expandable as well. We wanted to reach as much as possible uh, at the extent of our ability in this uh, project. Okay, and um, here I would like to share some quantitative and qualitative results with you from the evaluation. We see that in, in this evaluation of the Open Mint course, we saw that the over quality of the course was made as good. Uh, most of the people, the, the good represented by green color here, most of uh, the, the learners and facilitators as well thought that it was really good to have this platform in terms of navigation, the level of the students who participated, the learning circle and value of the activities themselves inside. So as we can see here, that was mostly positive in terms of the experience that they had. Facilitators now talked about um, if they learn new techniques on how they uh, uh, they can use in, in their teaching and uh, will they be using OER in the future. Take into consideration here that uh, when we are talking about facilitators in the South Mediterranean region, not all of them were previously involved in uh, open uh, as open educators, I would say. I had to happen to be one of them, and I'll tell you my story in short. Um, uh, one of the things that I would uh, focus in here, will you adopt the methodology of this course in your practice later on? The majority said yes, and this is actually a positive um, insight that you can get from this result. Now here is the qualitative part, which is I would, uh, something that I would like to focus on. Now, um, myself, I've been involved in this project since day one in my university. I represent Princess Suma University. I'm the director of the e-learning center. And uh, my day one in Princess Sumaya was the expert meeting of OpenMed there. <laughs> Uh, the vice president came to me and said, hey, I'm going to introduce you to some people. Their work might be so interesting to you, so let me show you. He introduced me to Daniel, and uh, Fabio was there. And afterwards, what is this all about? They said, it's open education. Open education? Can you get education really open? Are you kidding me? So um, that was... What, what, that, that's what was my mindset telling me, is that how can we make education really open? What is OER? You know, I've never heard of it, like a term OER, since uh, it was coined back by UNESCO's forum back in 2002, until now. And then I began to read more about it because I was about to involve in this project. I wanted to learn more how to use uh, OER and involve in my, course, in my courses and my techniques. Um, and I found that there was a problem between applying OER and uh, depending on the country itself. How am I doing at the time? Okay. All right. 
um, between um, the policies that are applied in my country, which is Jordan, and other countries in the region, and how to contrast them with the European Union in this uh, project so that I can get benefit from everybody and share and exchange ideas. What I found is that uh, the problem of OER in the closed education systems resides in the very definition of what OER is. OER, openly or freely accessible, openly licensed. Again, freely accessible, openly licensed. When you are being open, you're moving this way. When you want to care about privacy and security of your stuff, you're going to move this way. So that's actually applied in every aspect of higher education in Jordan that they really didn't grasp the idea of OER at the beginning. And I'm talking as a facilitator from one of these countries. Uh, I began to understand OER and the opportunity and the vistas of, um, um, I would say, uh, cooperation that I can open with other universities and how expandable it is. Uh, so I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I'm going to go really quickly through these findings and uh, focus on some of them. For example, facilitator C, I don't know who that is, but I, I agree with them, to make more visual materials and improve the quality of the produced videos as one of the uh, recommendations that they made to, to make the course uh, uh, more Im um, you know, impactful and uh, more reachable to everyone else. One of the um, notes that we got on the course of the Open Med is that it has uh, a lot of te textual content, although though I've been involved also in designing the course, I've been there in the beginning, and we try to involve as much as we can from different multimedias and um, in order to make them understand how OER works, how to use them, reuse them, improve them, and implement them in other places, and also how to use the open licenses. Uh, so um, maybe it was depending on the uh, type of learners in which region are you talking about. Some learners prefer to be more textual, others maybe more visual. There are some people in the middle who are in the mix, you know. Okay, and from the in-depth interviews, I can share many of the readings, um, uh, readiness uh, for uh, OER adoption and um, how to develop that and uh, making the experts in open education appointed to influence um, uh, positions like the director of e-learning centers in each university to be a reactor for OER and a promoter for their learning circle in the, uh, in the future. I would like to mention and uh, reassure that this course was in a pilot phase. All of what I'm showing here is something to be more improved, is something to be translated into three languages, Arabic, um, it's basically in English, but it's going to be uh, translated in Arabic and French. We're still working on that, but for sustainability, we um, are working on having several scenarios where this project is going. Uh, two of most is, and I think that's going to be uh, linked with the, with the main challenges of this project, is that um, we, we would like to have this course also implemented in each university or in each partner so that everybody would get benefit out of it and we are also having the idea and the possibility to also link it with other organizations and extracting it out to different LMS systems. Um, okay. So, yeah, that, that was actually uh, explained uh, in my uh, talking before. And uh, the improvement and validation of this course uh, is going to be continuously uh, happening. But what I wanted to say here is that some countries, and I would relate with this with the title of the previous presentation, some countries are open in education, but not open enough. Some other countries or other educational systems are really close. What I see from here, uh, the real value is, is at least to introduce people to this concept. I mean, there's always a, sh a shocking factor, you know? You have to get used to it and uh, see it and get out of your comfort zone and learn something new and keep moving forward. I see that's a big value in this one, learning a new paradigm, relatively new paradigm for, for myself and uh, for many scholars in my country uh, in order to get to it, learn something new and uh, keep moving forward with it. I uh, see there's a lot of potential in this one, and um, thank you so much for listening. I really don't want to keep blah 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 about many things here, but I would also save the last few minutes for any questions that you'd like to ask. Thank you. Okay, 
you're wonderful. Thank you so much, Adi. Yeah. Um, my apologies earlier, I didn't pass the microphone to the questioners, so I'm going to do that this time. And can I see if there are any questions from anyone? Oh, yes. yes. Do you have a mic? You do. Um, hello, thank you very much for this very inter interesting presentation. I would have a question about the learning circles. Um, how did the interaction work between uh, a facilitator and the learning circle, then within the learning circle itself, and then between the learning circles? Okay, good question. So uh, there was uh, an interaction between the learning circles, I would say. Uh, that was uh, back in also Turin a week. We gathered them all together and um, they promised to keep on working together maybe uh, to present a project, uh, a final project at the end of the course. Uh, we opened the door for everybody from different circles to talk to each other because that's what really it is about. Um, uh, we wanted to have this international sense in this project. But uh, let me get inside each learning circle. It was uh, a fully online uh, uh, technique. And uh, this is something that I can also relate in terms of uh, the Jordanian regulations, for example. I can talk in behalf of my country. We have something weird that is called the blended learning. It's not really weird, it's weird in Jordan. Um, they, they provided the ability to uh, present the uh, course, any course in any university, with 25% as an online content. What about the other 75, uh, the other percentage? Well, you can have them as face-to-face. -face. Well, that would destroy the whole concept of what MOOC really is. And uh, there were also certain challenges uh, that we faced in terms of uh, the ability uh, for learners to uh, learn through uh, online platforms. We use Sakai uh, as an LMS, and uh, some students or, uh, from our learning circles didn't have the technical ability you know, yet enough to get involved in this course. There were some technical problems in some, uh, in some areas of Jordan uh, in terms of internet connectivity and stuff, but we were able to overcome these challenges by addressing each of the learning circles problems before we started the uh, pilot project so that the pilot went through very smoothly. And I think that we've learned a lot uh, even before we started the pilot project because we had to encounter some challenges that we waited long before we faced them. And now with OpenMed, the time has come to, fa to face them and overcome them. Yeah, so thank you so much for this question. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? It's hard to see. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Can I just know? Just to complement uh, uh, something, uh, when we d well, two, two, two interesting things about this course. First, it was developed and designed completely collaborative. So we met all the partners in Madrid for three days and we really worked hard starting from zero. So starting from designing one by one the learning objectives and taking into account uh, the situation in every single country. And it was for sure a learning experience for the South Mediterranean partner, but much more probably from for the Northern partners because, you know, we, we, we tend to consider ourselves experts in, in the course design and instructional design, and there we had really to start from scratch because the situation is very different in every country. And then about the collaboration uh, among the, learnings, the, the learning circles from different countries. So at, at the national level, it's quite easy because people know each other and they were sharing stuff. Um, the, the, the trick we use there is to, to focus on the final project work on every learner. So every learner in this course had to read some, read some stuff, take some modules, uh, run some activities, and then develop a final project work, which uh, in most cases is actually an artifact, an OER, a piece of a course, and so on. And so we, let's say, the, 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 the bet there is to share and to work together then on these on these projects, not so much in the in the learning process. Even if, and this was quite surprising to me, the the forum discussions in the platform were pretty active. So normally we, we tend to be. I mean, I'm not quite skeptical about uh, how adult uh, university professors uh, use their time in in uh, responding to forum questions, but in this case it worked pretty well, showing again the the interest. I think. Uh, yeah. Um, Adi and Fabio and Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, that